Hey guys, this is Ken Finnan at Capital Advantage Tutoring. I'm here to help you with your Series 7 exam prep, your SIE exam prep, and all your other FINRA exam. So one of, one of my watchers, viewers if you want to call it, asked me if I could help with formulas. I gave a response what she should learn, but now I'm going to try to explain some of it. We have to worry about um, convertible stuff, okay? So convertible bonds, I'm not going to go too heavy into it, but understand, bonds are issued at par. And the numbers they have to give you to do to, to do to do the convertible stuff, you need to have the market price, the conversion ratio, or the convertible price, one of those two, and the prices of everything around it. So let's say you have an 8% convertible bond trading at 104, which is really 1,040, and it's convertible at $20 a share. And then the common stock is trading at, oh, let's say 23. So I'm gonna I have to bring my calculator out because I never do anything else on my handy dandy Android calculator. Now, the bond's trading at 104 and it can convertible at $20 a share. So the first thing I do to get the ratio, the ratio is how many shares you get if you convert, is going to be par, which is always a thousand, divided by 20, which is the convertible price. That gives me 50. So that means for every bond I convert, I get 50 shares. Now, on the test, they could just say it turns into 50 shares. There's the problem done. Also, don't worry about the, um, the with bonds versus preferreds, because if it's a bond or a preferred, if it's a bond, you use 1,000 as par. If it's a preferred, you use 100. And in reality, if you screwed up and use the wrong one, the numbers are the same. You just got to move a decimal here or there. It should still work out. So in this case, I get 50 shares. They may give it to you. They may say you get 50 shares per bond. Now, what you do is you take that and it still doesn't help you, but that means you're getting 50 shares of common and the common's trading at 23. So you're going to get 50 shares of a $23 stock and that'll be worth 50 times 23 is 11.50. Not sure if you can see it or not. Probably not because it's too bright. She's just looking at a white screen. So that means it's worth 1150. So if I were to take the bond and convert it into common stock, I would get $1150 worth of common stock because it's trading at $23. I'm getting 50 shares of it, 1150. Or I could sell the bond at 103, 104, whatever price I gave you, I'll get less. So it's not as good. So that's where that comes in. That so then you compare, okay, what's better? Well, the common stock is trading above the bond, so I would convert. Now, if, if it was the other way around and say the stock was trading at like $18 a share, again, you would do 50 times 18. That would give you 900. So now you could sell the bond for 103, 104, whatever I gave you, or you could convert it and get $900 worth of stock. Which would you rather do? I think you would rather do sell the bond for 104, not convert it and only get 900 shares. I hope that helps a little bit with convertibles. Another one is the balance sheet stuff. Don't, if you try to memorize every balance sheet question there is, you're going to go nuts. Don't try to do it. Try to get as, get a good base, like current yield, not current yield, um, PE ratio, earnings per share, and I'll do them, stuff like that. And you probably have to know the effect of a of the dividend. Okay. So first, earnings per share. It's as simple as it says, because we in Wall Street are actually morons, despite saying how smart we are. So earnings per share is the earnings per share. So we have earnings, say it's a million dollars of earnings, and we have, say, 500,000 shares outstanding. So it's a million divided by 500,000, $2 a share. That's my earnings per share. Now, they might throw a preferred in there. Remember, preferred gets paid before common. We all know that. So you would say, say there's 100, 200,000 in preferred that you're paying. So you do a million minus 200,000, which gives you 800,000. So I do 800,000 divided by how many shares are outstanding? 500,000. That's going to be 1.6 per share. So my earnings per share is $1.60. That's my earnings per share. That's how much I'm earning for every share out there. Not horrible. Now. They may ask you P.E. ratio, which is price to earnings. Again, we are morons, so let's talk about it. So P.E. is price to earnings. So let's say we have $1.60 a share, and let's say the stock is trading at 16 bucks a share. I'm doing the easy math. 
So I would do 16 divided by $1.60, that gives me 10. That's a 10 PE. A PE of 10 is a multiple of 10. It's a very low price stock. It's more of a value stock. Anything over like 32 is a gross stock kind of thing, which means it's a very high, the price is a lot higher than what it's earning. Um, that's one thing. Um, P-E ratio is not impacted by stock splits. Remember that? So if you do a stock split, P-E ratio doesn't change because what happens is the market price drops and the earnings per share drops at the same price. So the ratio stays the same. Declare a dividend. Dividend? Sounds like I'm saying Gilligan. Dividend. If you declare a dividend, what happens on the balance sheet? Okay, so we have our net worth or shareholders equity is total assets minus total liabilities. Assets is everything we own. Liabilities is everything we owe. So let's say we have a million dollars assets and zero liabilities. What a great company. So that means we have a million dollars in total equity, shareholders equity or, my God, net worth. Okay. Now let's say I declare a $200,000 dividend. I now owe 200 grand because I declared it. So my liabilities go up to 200,000. So I have a million outstanding, a million assets and I now have 200,000 liabilities, so my net worth or shareholders equity is only 800 grand. Here's the magic part. So then let's go a week later and we decide, two weeks later, three weeks later, we pay it. So when the, when the stock goes ex-dividend and we actually pay the dividend, well, we pay it out of our assets, we pay $200,000, so that goes down to now 800 grand, but guess what? Our liabilities go down also to zero because we don't owe it anymore. So boom, that goes to zero, and our net worth slash shareholders equity is still 800,000. I'm gonna get in the car right now and I'll be right back to you. Okay, how about tax equivalent yield, okay? So tax equivalent yield is you're trying to compare a corporate bond to a muni, okay? So you're trying to pay a corporate bond to a muni. So if you have a 9% corporate, or let's say a 10, because I can't do math. Say you have a 10% corporate, you're paying taxes on that shit. And then you have a muni, which you're paying, say it's a 8% muni, you're not paying taxes on it. But how the hell do you compare the two? You can't. It's very hard to compare the two since you're apples and oranges. So you have to either bring the muni, you have to either bring the corporate down to the muni level, make it after tax, or bring the, cor the muni up to the corporate. So let's do the corporate. So if I have a corporate bond and I'm paying, say I'm in the 15% tax bracket, I wish, say I was in the 15% tax bracket, I would do, so now remember, that means I'm bringing home 85%. So if I have a 10% bond that I'm paying 15% taxes, I'm bringing home 85% of that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply 10 times 0.85, which is 85%. And that tells you what I'm gonna bring home after taxes. So 10 times 0.85 is 8.5%, okay? So 8.5% is my tax-free yield. That's what I compare versus the muni, because remember, if I buy a 10% corporate, I'm in the 15% bracket, again, I wish, and I bring home 85% of that, I'm getting, bringing home 8.5% after taxes. And remember, the muni is technically always after taxes. So if I have an 8% muni versus a 10% corporate in the 15% bracket, 10 times 0.85, it gives me 8.5%. 8 That's better than the muni. So in that case, I'm better off buying the corporate. But if I was in like the 30% bracket, I would do 10 times 0.7, 100 minus the tax bracket. I would bring home 7%, or yeah, which is a full point lower than um, the muni. So I would choose the muni in that case. Now, if they give you the muni and not the corporate, say they ask the stupid question, oh, I have a 4% muni, what is my, what corporate bond would be the equivalent? I do the same thing, but I divide. So I take the 4% corporate, 4% muni, I'm stuttering, 4% muni, and divide it by. So if I am in the, say I'm in the 20% bracket, and I have a 4% muni, I'm gonna do four divided by 80%, or four divided by 0.8, and that gives me my tax equivalent yield. That's bringing the muni up to the corporate level. Okay, so if I, so remember this, you multiply the corporate and you divide the muni. Remember that. You multiply the corporate and you divide the muni. Okay, more later. Now, a quick one to follow up now that I am wherever I am. You notice I'm not in the hotel, right? You probably, you guys are smart. I did this before I got in the car. So, okay. Or did I? It's dark out. 
What is going on? I just can't figure it out. Oh, by the way, I'm somewhere in here. I'm going to throw a question and I'm going to answer it on my live. So I would say don't even leave comments. You can if you want, but I'm going to leave. I'm going to answer it tomorrow night or on Tuesday night on my live. So you kind of got to pay attention. So if you get some of the formulas you're going to get are for options. Options go this way. This is the, I'm just doing the easy stuff. If you buy a call or you sell a call, it's strike plus premium. That's it. That's your break even. If you buy a put or sell a put, it's strike minus premium. That's easy. If you have stock and an option, it is stock plus or minus premium. How do you know which to do? If you buy stock and buy a put, there's two buys, you add. If you buy stock and sell a call, that's a buy and a sell, you subtract. If you short stock and buy a call, that's a buy and a sell, you subtract. I'm seeing a pattern. If I short stock and short a put, they're the same, I have two sells, I add. So if they're the same, buy, buy, or sell, sell, I add. If it's a buy and a sell, I subtract. That's your break even, okay. For straddles, break even is stock plus total premiums, stock strike plus total premiums, and call strike, boy, I'm stuttering. I'll try again, straddles, are call strike plus total premium and put strike minus total premium. So if you have the two premiums, you add them together. They could trick you by saying, oh, instead of saying you bought a call at five and a put at four, that's nine. They may just say you bought a straddle for nine. It's the same thing. Long or short straddle doesn't matter. It's always call plus total premiums and put minus. I'll do the spreads another time. Okay, now, okay, you know what? Screw it, I'll do it this way. If it's a call spread, you add the net to the lower strike. If it's a put spread, you subtract the net from the higher strike. It's that simple. Those are break-evens. That doesn't help you answer all the questions, but that does get you through the break-evens. Another formula. I'm going to do the quick and dirty. Margin. That's when you're borrowing shares. Margin. Equity is, and these are, they have to give you market value and debit. They have to. They have to, have to, have to. So market value minus debit is your equity. It makes sense. It's what it's worth minus what I owe equals my equity. I'm happy with that. So if I have a market value of 50 and a debit balance of 20, 50 minus 20, equity is 30. They're going to ask you SMA. SMA is extra equity. So if you have an equity of 30, well, how much do they want? Oh, if you remember from reading, they want 50% of the market value. So 50% of 50 is 25. That's how much they want. That's rate T. I have 30. I have five extra. That's my SMA. Easy stuff. On the short side, watch it again if you don't get it. Short side, it's not debit. It's a credit because you're borrowing and selling shares. So equity is credit minus market. Credit minus market. So if I have, so and that's my equity. And then SMA is the same formula. Equity minus the rate T. So it's not harder than this. Credit balance of 80. Market, short market or market value of 50. That gives me an equity of 30. My rate T is half of the market value, not the credit, the market. So half of 50 again is 25. 30 minus 25 is five. Boom, there we are. SMA is five. Not brain surgery, but the books do a horrible job. So here's my question for you. Customer bought 1,000 shares of ABC at 20 bucks and writes 10 ABC October 25 calls for two. The calls expire and the stock was sold at $26.25. What is the cost basis? I'm asking, what is the cost basis? So again, the customer bought 1,000 shares of ABC at 20, writes 10 ABC, 25 calls at two. The calls expire. The stock was sold at $26.25. What is the cost basis? So is it A, 20? Is it B, 20, 25? Is it C, 22? Is it D, 26.25? I will answer it on my live, and if you guys want to leave comments and leave your choice, that's fine too. Another formula that, or mathy thing that people may need is accretion and amortization. Now, real quick, just the rules on this. If it's an OID, which means zero coupon, you must accrete, no matter what it is. Muni, treasury, corporate, doesn't matter. If it's a secondary market discount, you can do the cost method where you don't accrete. So accretion is where you're adjusting the cost basis up on a discount. And if it's a premium, you're adjusting the cost basis down. So if it's an, if you have a 
discount bond you would accrete if you have a premium you would amortize. OID, zero coupon, you must accrete. Secondary market discount, you don't have to. You can do cost. If it's a premium, munis must amortize. Corporates and treasuries do not. Now, let's talk about this. This is very easy, I think. You're going to take the distance from par. So par is 1,000. The amount above or below par that it is, whether it's 1,200 or 800, whatever it is. So if it's 800 and it's 10 years to maturity, you're going to go 800 is 200 below par. 200 divided by 10 years, that's how long to maturity. That's 200 divided by 10 is 20. That's 20 bucks a year. Every year you're increasing the cost basis by 20 bucks. Now that, if it's an OID, that's considered interest. So on a corporate, it's taxable. On a treasury, it's taxable on the federal level. And on a muni, it's not taxable at all because it's interest. But you're adjusting the cost basis up and that may or may not be taxable. If it's And then what happens is that's your new cost basis. So buy a bond for 80 or 800, 10 years to maturity, 20 bucks a year. After three years, it's now 860, if I did the math right. If you sell the bond for 880, you pay taxes on the 20. That makes sense. If you hold the bond to maturity of no capital gain or loss, because you're, you're accreting to par, it's holding it at par. If you buy a premium, say for 1200, I like easy numbers. Say you buy a bond for 1200 or 120, as they say. If you If it's 10 years to maturity, you're gonna do 200 divided by 10. That's 20 bucks a year. You're gonna drop it down by 20 bucks a year. You're amortizing down, you're reducing the cost basis, not the proceeds. So amortize, you're dropping the cost basis every year by the amount, and accretion, you're adding. Okay.